Siamo a Roma per un incontro di altissimo livello che ha visto riuniti molti dei più importanti ematologi italiani per fare il punto sul linfoma di Hodgkin e sulle sue più moderne strategie di cura. A questo incontro c'era anche un, un ospite straniero di eccellenza, il professor Enes Junes, uno dei più grandi ematologi del mondo che lavora presso lo Sloan Kettering Hospital di New York. Uh, professor Junes, how it has changed the, the cure of uh, Hodgkin linfoma uh, over the last 30-40 years? Right. So the cure rate of Hodgkin lymphoma has significantly improved over the last four decades. Today we expect to cure approximately 80% of patients with uh, Hodgkin lymphoma regardless of the stage, which is a remarkable success story. It used to be about 40-50% about 40 years ago. Uh, in, in your presentation, you did a, a comprehensive overview of the treatment uh, of the, the, the four stages of the disease. Let's start with the first, uh, the, the first and the second stage of the disease, which is the standard of care. Right. So patients with early stage Hodgkin lymphoma are uh, classified into early favorable and early unfavorable disease. Regardless whether you're favorable or unfavorable, you have an expected cure rate exceeding 90% using standard chemotherapy of ABVD plus radiation therapy, so what we call combined modality treatment. For advanced stage disease, we still use a chemotherapy combination regimens, and the most widely used combination is called ABVD, but other people can use BACOB or escalated BACOB uh, regimen. And let's move to the uh, most severe patient, those on the uh, stage of three and four. What do you do in these patients? Right, so again, a stage three or four disease are treated uh, with a standard combination chemotherapy. At my center, we use ABVD regimen, which is expected to cure about 70% of the patients with advanced stage three and four Hodgkin lymphoma. But if you don't respond to ABVD or relapse after ABVD, we usually use second line therapy frequently platinum-based regimens or gemcitabine-based regimens, followed by autologous stem cell transplant. For patients who do not respond to uh, salvage therapy, then they are candidate for other treatments. These are called technically transplant ineligible, and they can be treated with uh, agents like brentuximab vedotin or a different type of combination therapy, hoping that they will achieve a remission then taken to into transplant. Which are the results of, uh, um, with the brentuximab vedotin, which is the most uh, new newest product uh, uh, available for this setting of patients. Right. A single agent, and especially in patients who had a prior autologous transplant, regardless of the number of, of, of regimens between the transplant and getting the uh, brentuximab vedotin, the response rate is 75%, with the complete remission rate is about 35%, which is remarkable for a single, single agent with little uh, side effects. Uh, you presented also your scheme of therapy um, after the transplant and maybe also before the transplant. What, what do you do exactly? Right. So let's start after transplant. So after autologous transplant, then uh, brentuximab is approved for this indication. So we use brentuximab vedotin as single agent. It's usually given once every three weeks, 1.8 milligram per kilogram, until disease progression, toxicity, or up to 16 cycles. If you use brentuximab vedotin in post-transplant setting, the response rate, as I said, is about 75%, and the complete remission rate is about 34%. In the pre-transplant setting, there's limited experience, but the single agent gives you similar response rate with a similar uh, complete response rate in pre-transplant setting. And also sometimes happens that after the brentuximab vedotin therapy, you decide not to proceed immediately with the transplant because the patients stay well? No, so this, you're referring to uh, allogeneic transplant. So frequently we have patients who had autologous transplant, then they have progression of disease with Hodgkin lymphoma. Then we give them brentuximab vedotin. Now if they achieve only partial remission, which is about 60% or so, then yes, we think about allogeneic transplant, we look for a donor and so forth. The question is if you achieve a complete remission with brentuximab vedotin, what to do with these patients? I think this is an area of debate. Some of us would observe the patients until they progress. If they progress again, then we can retreat again with brentuximab, vedotin, or other agents, and then take them to allotransplant. And some of us would prefer to take the patient directly into allogeneic transplant. I think this is still uh, sort of like a learning curve. Professor Jones, which is the message for the patient? Because they're usually young patients, so all of their life is in front of them, but with this terrible disease. What we can tell to them? I think now we have a, an active agent that provides hope. Uh, let's say five, six years ago, really we didn't know what to do with these patients, especially those who do not 
respond or relapse after autologous transplant. With the approval of brintuximab protein, there is clearly hope. We're not done yet. We need to um, um, uh, combine brintuximab protein with other agents, move it to upfront, uh, hoping we cure more patients before we go to transplant so we can decrease the need for transplant. We need to learn how to combine brintuximab protein with other agents in relapse setting, but it opened the door for, for a lot of other options in the future that didn't exist before, and that's extremely new hope for these patients.